Exchanging information over a network is a very complex task. You first need to find your destination. Then you have to transmit your data over possibly multiple links. You have to take into account all kinds of events like congestion, link failures. It's very hard to think of all these things together and solve all this problem at once. Thus, we need to think of a way to break these things into smaller tasks in order to, to plan and make a network work. Breaking the problem into simpler ones is the solution. To do this, we look at the network as providing a set of services. Some of these services are independent, some are dependent on other ones. This form a set, a set of layering where on the lowest layer we have the services that don't depend on any other services and then we gradually build the layers until we get the full service set of a network. Each service is implemented using software that resides in both ends of a connection. These are called peer entities. Each peer entity is talking to the other one using some logical connection, but not a physical one. The physical connection is going through the stack of services from the upper one down to the lower one, then crossing the physical layer and back up to the entity we talk about. A service is implemented using a protocol. The protocol defines basically three things. The message syntax, which means what fields it contains and what is the format of each field. Then we have the message semantic, which is what does the message mean. And finally, the protocol has to define the action that an entity should take once it receives a message. For example, an HTTP server that receives a GET request should send a data to the other entity. So, let, so let's look at a simple task to understand the complexity of layering. Suppose you want to send a file over a network that may lose packets. If I want to design a simple protocol, I would send the file as a series of numbered packets. That is, I'm going to use a, a numbering, a sequence of numbering for the packets so I can track which one arrived or discarded by the network. Now, as a receiver, I can look at the numbers and identify which of the packets arrived and which are missing. So at the end of the transmission, the receiver can send the sender an acknowledgement that all packets have arrived or a request to resend the missing packets. The sender would wait for the acknowledgement for the receiver and resend the request. If after a while there's no response from the receiver, the server may just restart the entire process. Now this simple protocol seems okay but when you look at it for a, a longer time, you see that there are some problems. For example, how long should a sender wait before it restart submission of all the packets? What, if it, what happens if a link is failing? Because if a link went down, there's no point in resending again and again the packet. They will never reach the destination. So there's a problem that the acknowledged message from the, send, from the receiver may be lost. So when we design a protocol, we have to take into account many, many aspects of what can happen in the network or between the peer entities. This is what makes networking so complex. So a network that provides many services needs many protocols. As we said before, some of the services are independent while others depend on others. So if a protocol A may use protocol B as a procedure in its execution, for example, the file transfer protocol we talked about before is using a packet transfer protocol or maybe using a packet transfer protocol as a basic block for its operation. And the dependency forms layering. So a set of protocol layers is called a protocol stack. Each protocol, as we said, depends on the one on the lower layers. We have many advantages for this uh, uh, way of uh, layering protocols. An important one is that once a service is defined, the implementation details can be hidden from the upper layers. And you can further improve this uh, uh, service 
as we better understand its operation without changing the entire protocol stack. Namely, it decouples the changes between different layers and enable us to improve each of the services. Another important advantage is the reuse of functionality. Some protocol may be used by many other services in the upper layers and thus save us from reprogramming re this functionality again and again in each service. However, layering comes at a cost in performance. Since we hide from the upper layer what happens in the lower layer, which what we call abstraction, the upper layer can act only on the operation that it has, which means that it's not always optimized for its operation. For example, if you look at a flow control protocol that see a packet loss, it will assume that it's always due to congestion and thus maybe uh, lower the rate at which application can send its packets. However, packet loss can happen due to multiple reasons. For example, packet corruption. Thus, if a packet is lost due to corruption, to corruption the flow control protocol may assume that congestion occurs and lower the rate at which packet can be transmitted. This is, of course, not optimal. So, because of this tension between abstraction and performance, we deliberately sometimes violate the layering. And this is happening in the TCP and IP protocol, that the TCP is allowed somehow to peek into IP and get some extra information. A recent example, which become very common, is the cross-layer design of ad hoc routing protocols where the networking layers looking at what's happening in the physical layer and the data link layer in order to better uh, adjust the routing protocol. The International, the International Standard Organization, ISO, generated what it called the OSI reference model, which has greatly influenced the thinking about protocol stacks. The protocol is a reference model that formally defines what it means by a layer, a service, and all other uh, jargon we're using. It defines a full service architecture describing the services provided by each layer and each service within a layer. It defines a set of protocols that can implement the services, but of course allows other protocols to be included as long as they obey the interfaces. This slide is taken from the OSI standard, and it shows that it divided the network basically to seven layers, from the lowest one, the physical layer, to the application layer at the top. <clears throat> the two ends of the connection, these are the end hosts, and they have all the seven layers. In between, inside the network, only the, the lowest three layers exist. Since we try to do anything we can, end-to-end -end without the network involvement. Communication, of course, is all about data. <clears throat> when an application has a data, it adds to it some header, application header, that describes what this data is and pass it down to the presentation layer. This layer adds its own header, pass it down, until it reaches the transport layer. Each layer is adding a header and this entire header plus data of the previous layer is regarded as the data for the layer below. At the network layer, in many cases, the transport layer, uh, the transport packet, PDU, what we call, is too large to be transmitted. So it is divided into smaller chunks. Each is equipped with its own network header and transmitted through the network. The data link usually adds to the data both a header and a trailer because it needs to delineate the data uh, frames from each other and then eventually the physical layer transmit bits. The physical layer, the lowest one, is generally at the business of uh, electric engineers and not of networking people. It is responsible for the bit transmission between two physically connected end systems. The standards here typically describe things like coding scheme to represent bits, connector physical shapes and sizes, and bit level synchronization. The data link layer is responsible for reliable communication over a single physical link. The bits are grouped into frames, and you need idle markers to identify periods where the link is not carrying data. 
There are typically also begin and end markers to delimit the frame. In many cases, the link is not point to point, but it is a broadcast channel, such as what's happening in Wi-Fi networks. In this case, we need that the data link layer will also have addresses, so we know which of the stations that are part of the broadcast channel is the recipient of the frame. We need also scheduling to decide who is going to be speaking next, because now multiple st stations can start transmitting it at once. This function provided what, what we call a medium access control sublayer that is part of the data link layer. The data link layer strongly depends on the physical layer, of course. So usually the data link and the physical layer are bundled together in the network interface card, the NIC. For example, if you have a, an Ethernet NIC or a Wi Fi NIC, it performs both the physical and the data link layer. The network layer is responsible for carrying data between the source and destination through a network. It's logically concatenating a set of links in the network to form an obstruction of an end-to-end -end link. It allows any two-end systems in the network to communicate by computing a route between them. This route may dynamically change as the network changes. It hides the peculiarities of the data link layers and maybe even the different data link layers inside the network. And it provides a unique network-wide address to be able to identify hosts. The network layer is the highest layer available inside the network. For example, the internet, it's in the routers. It performs basically three tasks. Routing, to creating the routing table, which we use in order to forward packets forwarding, which is based on the routing tables. This is taking the packets coming from one port of the router and putting it in the correct port of the output. And then queue management, scheduling which packet to transmit first and dropping packet in case of congestion. In the internet, the network layer is implemented using the IP protocol, which gives each interface a unique IP address worldwide. It gives us end-to-end -end link obstruction, routing, forwarding, and scheduling, as we discussed above. But it also gives us segmentation and reassembly. That is, if a packet is arrived which is too large, the IP protocol is possible to segment the packet into smaller chunks, transmit it over the links where it cannot be it cannot go through, through because of its size, and then reassemble it back to get the uh, uh, full-size IP packet. The IP protocol gives us only best effort service, which means packets are not assured to arrive to the destination, but the IP will do its best to provide it. The transport layer gives us uh, the notion of reliable end-to-end -end communication. As we said before, the network layer always gives us best effort service and we would like to have a reliable end-to-end -end communication. Thus, the transport services include error control, flow control, and multiplexing. Error control promises that the message will reach its destination despite packet loss, corruption, or duplication. In case of packet loss, we simply have to identify this and retransmit. In case of corruption, we have to detect the corruption, discard the corrupted packet, and retransmit. And in case of duplication, we need to, to detect the duplicate packet and discard it. Flow control makes the transmission adapt the rate to the available bandwidth on the pass. And this has to be done dynamically since the available bandwidth on the pass may change. It also has to adapt to the destination availability because the source may be able to submit to transmit packets at a higher rate than the destination can accept. Finally, the transport layer should provide us with multiplexing to allow multiple application or multiple connection between two end hosts to be done at the same time. In the, end, in the internet, there are two main transport layer protocols, TCP, TCP provides us error control, flow control, and multiplexing as described above. 
Multiplexing is done using a port number, which is a unique identifier for each connection. However, there's also UDP, which is a lightweight protocol with no error control and no flow control, and only multiplexing of connection is done, again, using a port number. Most of applications use TCP because of the good service it gives them, the reliability. However, in some cases, we don't need this. For example, in network management application, UDP is used and also in some video and audio streaming applications. The session and presentation layers in the OSI model are not common in the internet, thus will not be discussed today. The application layer is basically the set of applications that use the network. They do not provide services to other layers because this is the top layer. And in the internet, there are many, many applications. Uh, for example, for mail, we're using SMTP, IMAP, and POP protocols. For web browsing, we use the HTTP protocol, and for domain name resolution, we use DNS. So if you look at the TCP IP protocol stack, it is sit on top of the IP protocol at layer three. Above it, we have TCP and UDP, the transport layer, and then the many applications uh, which we haven't discussed, and, and some of them only appear here. The great thing about IP protocol is it can run on any physical or data layer, which makes TCP IP a ubiquitous protocol. So some remark on IP layering. First, as we said before, TCP and IP are not really abstracted, and TCP is allowed to look a little bit on what's happening in the IP layer. Another thing in IP layering is that functionality sometimes is duplicated in multiple layers. For example, checksums are used in multiple layers from layer two to the application layer. An interesting and important principle in IP layering is the end-to-end -end principle. The assumption is that the network is fast and dumb and the edges are intelligent. So any functionality that can be done end-to-end -end will not be done inside the network. Inside the network, we only have layers one and three and we only do things that we have to do in the network, for example, routing or queue management. This is the opposite from the good old telephony network. In telephony, the network switches are very sophisticated, while the end devices, the telephones, used to be simple. 